So next up then, we have uh, Sophie from Eddie Lux, our, our sponsor today, talking about time flies when you're counting flies. Did you come up with that title, Sophie? Or oh, I love it. <laughs> I did, I did. But I, I actually changed the presentation slightly. It's still about flies, everyone, but I'm not actually counting flies. <laughs> Uh, okay well listen we we all like to be surprised by things it's part of our, our job you know so we're all prepared for it um whatever you're talking about i'm sure it'll be amazing so listen i will um leave you to it running over just by a few minutes we'll we'll give you your your time so don't worry about that and please you know tell us about flies thank you sophie yeah. great so hopefully you can see my screen um, so I am still talking about flies. It's just when I started making this presentation, time really did fly and I made a presentation that was far too long for my slot. So I've condensed it down and instead of counting them, we're looking at them and I've got some great pictures of flies on glue boards. Um, and we're going to basically do a little bit of why it's important for having insect identification. So yeah, I'm Sophie. I am a technical training manager, which means I deliver training all across the UK, um, but I'm also here for technical um, knowledge. If you have any questions, if you have any insects to identify, please do yeah, contact us. So I'm talking about insects with catch on fly killers and fly killers are a great way, of course, of catching flies that enter our environment. So before they have touched, you know, a surface or some kind of food material, we can catch them on a fly killer before they contaminate these surfaces with different pathogens. And we know that flies and other insects carry a huge number of pathogens, which is why we count them as public health pests and why we need to control them. Um, and specifically flies, you know, they're happy to eat whatever. So here I have a picture of a bin and we've got some maggots in the bin because the flies don't mind. They'll eat waste material, they'll eat on things that are very unsanitary, full of pathogens, and then they will come along and eat our food as well, which is a prime way of them actually just walking over from one surface to another. They can transmit stuff like E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter. Um, but they can also, um, transmit it like internally. So flies don't have biting mouth parts, so they don't chew stuff. So if they come across a food substance, which is, you know, a bit hard, it's not just liquid, they actually bring up a bit of their last meal. So whatever that might have been, could have been something from a bin, could have been something worse. Um, and that's another way they can contaminate food sources uh, because yeah, they don't mind what they feed on. Even if uh, they're not carrying a pathogen. We still don't want to have those insects contaminating our food. So we don't want to eat insect legs or wings. Um, their bodies can affect, you know, like the taste, flavor of food. And yeah, you won't be able to sell food if it's contaminated with lots of insects. You know, So that's another reason to control them. Um, but along with fly killers actually catching the flies, it's great for identification of them. Um, fly killers are a monitoring tool. They are an excellent one because they have ultraviolet light, which most of insects find attractive. Um, I personally prefer glue board ones because then you can actually know what's turning up and it saves like bits of fly flying out the grid unit and landing other places. Um, so if you know what's on your fly killer, on your glue board, it help you identify places where you might have to proof better. Maybe people are keeping doors and windows open. Uh, maybe there are small gaps and cracks in the, the framework of the building. Maybe there are issues with housekeeping and cleaning. Maybe people aren't taking bins out. Maybe they're not cleaning effectively. Identification also can help you lead to that. Um, drainage issues. Some flies really like to live in sewers and um, pipes um, and drainage systems. So if you had like a crack in a pipe, you may get a certain type of fly. And so again, knowing the pest um, helps you to find that breeding location. Um, they can identification also can lead to finding out about pests you didn't even know you had on site before they become an issue. So if you catch them early on, you can highlight where that problem may be originating from and control it before it becomes a big issue, which is great. Um, and here we have a fly life cycle. Um, of course, we have adult flies, we have eggs, we have larvae, and then we have a pupa stage. Fly killers only catch adults. Um, and so it's really important to remember when we're thinking about the, the pest species, 
if it has a larval stage, we're going to have to find that where they are breeding because that fly killer will never control that larval stage. We're going to have to do basically better cleaning, better hygiene um, to actually control those. Yeah. Um, it's not just flies. Here we have some other breeding locations that we might not think about when we think about fly killers. Um, so I've got carpet on here. Uh, you get carpet beetles on fly killers quite a bit. They like UV light. Um, so yeah, you will also get carpet beetle adults on the carpet, at, on the fly killer. And then you can identify maybe you have a location that they're breeding somewhere on site. Could be both domestic and commercial sites. Um, maybe you get biscuit beetles, which is bottom right. Biscuit beetles also love UV light. They can end up in fly killers. Um, and so, yeah, you might have dog biscuits, biscuits we might eat. You might have stock cubes, any other type of food source, which the larvae are breeding in. And then you get the adults appearing on the fly killer. And then lastly, yeah, you might get fruit flies. So here we've got some uh, uh, fruit and vegetables that are starting to decay, go rotten. Um, so that's also what a species might get on the fly killer. But here you can see that just from one portion of a glue board, you might get many different problems occurring. So it's great to actually know about the pest. Yeah. Um, when you do take pictures for identification, um, it's great to actually have um, an in detail and focused image. So here I have an example of one of our glue boards. And it looks like an all right picture because you can see probably you've got some house flies, you've got some cluster flies, you've got some moths on there. Um, but when you zoom in and you actually try and figure out like the smaller species, it's quite difficult to take a picture and actually identify what is going on there. Again, like you'll be able to see most like the bigger species, but it's great to actually take a picture where you can see more of the wing detail, more of the hairs. Um, the size, colour is also really useful. Um, so when I take a picture, I've got a little video. Um, here we have a glue board again, and I'm going to focus on this green lacewing. Um, so there you go. That's my, that was what I would take a picture of. Um, not the whole glue board. And you don't want to have a picture that's too close to the insect. It's good to have a little bit of distance with your camera and then focus in. So if you see, if I just play it again, I get to the insect I want to look at. And then from this point on, I just zoom in. And that's a better way of taking a picture because then you actually see the contrast, the detail. Um, if you go too close, your camera kind of will start to focus on different things in that image. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a little tip. People have different techniques, but I find that's really useful when I take a picture. So what I was basically doing, or what I'll be talking about, is what I found on glue boards. So please, if you want to put it in the chat, that's fine. Um, I've got some starting relatively easy, and then we get harder and harder, I think, as we go through. So this is a wasp, yeah? And here I have a picture of it close up under a microscope. Um, and it's good because then you get to see the face in more detail, which is good for identification. So this was a common wasp. And what I know it's a common wasp because you can look at the faces of different wasps and uh, they basically have quite distinctive markings, which helps identify them. Um, so the common wasp has much more of like an anchor shape on the face. Uh, let me just put on my little pointer and then we can actually see what I'm pointing at. Um, so this is like, this is the anchor shape we talk about. Um, and it's quite distinctive. Um, you normally get common wasps or German wasps in the UK. Uh, German wasps will have little dots. So we have usually three dots, um, but this top dot on the face sometimes connects up. So it becomes more of a line than a specific dot. It, it just depends on the individual wasp. Um, but I specifically picked this picture because it's not just three dots. Usually it's normally much more of a line, but it does change. Um, and in the middle, we get the red wasp, which you might come across in the UK. Um, it also has an anchor shape on its face, but it's less wide than the common wasp. So it's a little bit more narrow. Um, that's quite, that might be a little bit more difficult when you first come looking at wasps. So 
You can also look at the back, which really helps to distinguish between a red wasp and a common wasp. So on a red wasp, you get kind of like this reddish coloring on the back of the, the abdomen to this part of the body. Um, and that's why it's called a red wasp as well, which is handy to remember. Um, so yeah, that's a clear way of telling these, uh, the common wasp and the red wasp apart. Um, you can also look at the thorax. So this is this section here. Um, with an insect, you get the head, you get the thorax, which is the middle part. Um, that normally has the wings and the legs attached. So it's quite a lot of um, muscle in that part of the body. And then the abdomen part of the insect is kind of what I describe as like the squishy part where you get like the organs of the insect usually like um, like a, a very reduced stomach and like a gastroenteritic, a gastroenteral system. So on this thorax, uh, wasps will have like three lines of two dots. Um, you can't see the bottom of that very clearly, I'm afraid, but it's around here. Um, anyway, so with a common wasp, this middle line of dots, the dots are very close together. Uh, they're not as separated as that first line. Whereas when you look at the German wasp, you can see that as evenly spaced as that first line. Um, so that's, we can use that. I, I find going on the internet and finding about identification of wasps e the easiest way to help with your species. Um, you can also use like pictorial keys, um, books, but I find the internet is actually really useful for, for me to find out about what insect I have. Um, so if you have wasps, you don't necessarily have to go to that level of detail of like which type of wasp you have. But if you have a wasp appearing on a fly killer, uh, it could just be an accidental entry, especially if your fly killer is near an open door or an open window or someone or a door that frequently gets opened by someone. So someone accidentally may have brought it in with them. If you get a few more or you notice that it's not just one fly killer or over time you see you see quite a few appearances of them, it looks like there might be an issue with door closure or window closure. So I know in summer it gets really hot, especially in food premises where you have like lots of heat being produced from cooking. And people love to open doors to help with the breeze. It, we've all been there. Um, but that allows entry of insects from the outside. Um, and food hygiene regulations in the UK uh, specifically say, you know, entry of insects into a food premise should be controlled um, because there's a risk of contamination of food sources. So it is there in the UK that places where you're preparing food should either keep their door closed or have something like a, a fly screen on it. Um, so yeah, if you have wasps, it looks like Windows and doors are frequently left open by staff. Uh, maybe you could educate them, train staff in the importance of door closure and window closure. Um, that'd be great if you can. If they, if they don't follow that instructions, then maybe consider saying, get a fly screen then, get a PVC curtain baby. Uh, that's more of like an internal door to stop their progression of the insects through a, a site or a factory. Um, but a fly screen would be a great way to stop people propping open doors, keeping windows open in the summer. Yeah. So and that's kind of how I'm going to frame it. I'm going to find my insect, have a little look close up on the microscope. And what does that mean in terms of uh, the pest management on that site? Um, and I took a picture down the microscope there. And I'll just tell you, I've got a video of how I took that picture. So, Sorry about the dusty microscope. I realized after it really needed to clean. Um, but here you go, this is me go focusing with my phone down a microscope. Um, and here I'm just moving the glue board and keeping my phone completely still. I'm just moving the glue board up and down very slightly to actually get a good shot of that hole of that insect. Yeah. So that's what I'm gonna do for most of the insects here. Show a picture on the glue board and then another close-up picture under the microscope. So the next insect we have uh, was this one. Um, again, if you want to put guesses in the, the chat, you're, off, you're, you're welcome to. Um, this is a fly, obviously. It's got two wings, which makes it a fly. 
Um, and then you can just about see like these golden hairs appearing on the thorax, which is a great clue. So here is a close up of those hairs. And you can also see like the bristles on the thorax, which most insects or most flies have. Um, so it's a cluster fly. Yeah. Cluster flies, those golden hairs are really representative. They're normally a little bit bigger than a common house fly, um, but the hairs are a great clue. Um, and classifiers talking about their biology. You're unlikely to find just like normally one classifier. They normally would appear as a group, as a cluster, as the name suggests. Um, it's very hard to actually manage them because they don't breed in like food sources we produce or bins. Um, they actually rely on earthworms to complete their life cycle. So it's a really interesting life cycle. Um, the fly will lay eggs on soil outside and then the larvae or the maggots hatch out of the eggs and they bury into the soil and try and find an earthworm. They then parasitize the earthworm, so they enter the body of the earthworm and kind of eat it on the inside out. Um, and then they emerge as an adult fly later. And usually we get them in winter or late autumn where temperatures start to cool down and the flies would like to overwinter somewhere nice and warm. Um, so here I have a picture I actually took in Ireland on holiday because they had a cluster fly problem where I was staying um, and usually you'll get loads of cluster flies around window edges um, because they're trying to get back outside um, in spring um, and you can see like, like all this uh, fly spotting lots of dead flies um, so yeah, trying to escape near windows. Um, to control them, I mean, you could kill all the earthworms, that's probably not very advisable. Um, so we actually act, um, promote good proofing, trying to keep those flies out of entering those normally lost spaces or uh, buildings high up facing the sun. So like normally the southwesterly facing buildings that will get nice and warm. Um, better proofing, like try and get rid of small gaps, cracks and crevices. Um, you can get fly killers, but make sure there's no risk of fire. Um, and also the problem with fly killers is that the glue board either fills up really quickly, because of course they cluster and you get hundreds, or your cat's tray would also fill up very quickly. Um, so you can get cat's trays which are bigger, which are, are deep, um, but they're only for fluorescent units at the moment. There's no cluster fly solution for um one with it in the led light source at the moment so our new fly clothes we get we'll get seen on the market okay so that's the class of fly then we have this one uh quite distinctive i find um you can see like that kind of bluish color which gives you a deep, good uh, clue of what it could be it has lost a bit of a leg there in the picture you see um, and under the microscope, it was a bit big. I actually had to take it in two pictures because you couldn't see the whole of the insect. Um, it is a blue bottle. And blue bottles, generally we call those califora. Uh, they, we get uh, green bottles and blue bottles. Generally the blue bottles are more califora species. Um, and yeah, that bluish color, metallic, kind of shiny. Uh, they slides are like quite noisy, quite large. Uh, you normally notice them if they're buzzing in a room. Um, and on the back of their thorax, again, you can see those, those prominent hairs, quite bristly, we say. So blue bottles and green bottles are signs that you might have a dead animal. Uh, they are known to both like sources of protein. So you might have a dead rat or mouse. You may have a dead bird. The animal could be outside or you could have it around places where you're processing meat because you'll get a lot of like runoff of juices, off carts of meat. Um, and the flies is like a beacon to them. They, they're good at, really good at sensing them, finding those locations, and then they want to lay their eggs in these locations because it, it provides a really good diet for the flies, the maggots. Um, here is not a very nice picture I know, but we've got a glue board. This was found in a supermarket around six years ago. Obviously, I mean, we know about glue boards that are, are gonna be removed. Um, they're highly contentious. We might keep them in England, 
Um, but obviously this is bad global control because we had um, animals dying and that attracted these, the flies to the supermarket and then they laid their eggs in the, the dead rodents. Um, so then they had a mouse problem and now the, then they had a fly problem on top of that, which was not good. Um, management, find that dead carcass, try and clean up any residues. If like it's not a dead animal, maybe if it's a site actually producing meat, make sure they have a really good cleaning policy. Um, all that waste material gets drained away and it doesn't accumulate outside like in this picture on the top. Yeah. Cool. And then we have two on a glue board. I've included them both here because on the right, you see up close, we can see that shiny color again. Uh, we've got those bristles on the bottom. Um, it's green one, it's a green bottle. Um, and then on the right, well, this picture here, it's left on this one. Uh, this one's a bit more of a complicated one. This one is called a window or wood gnat. Sometimes you see it as a window midge or wood midge. Um, and I'm going to go into the details of that one. But green bottles, just like blue bottles, we normally call green bottles Lucilia, um, but they're very similar in types of behavior and biology to blue bottles. So feeding on dead animals, attracted to sources of protein. So the window midge or wood gnat, it does look quite like a mosquito. Um, I'd say mosquitoes are a bit more thin um, and the antenna of the mosquito is a bit more long, which helps you to tell them apart. Uh, window midges um, are really associated with decaying wood and vegetation. Normally in a wood or where you have collection of trees, you get leaf litter and you get decaying wood over time. Um, this fly loves to actually lay their eggs and the larvae will eat that decaying material naturally. Um, when we see them in a site, usually it's associated more, associated more with sewage. So you get like decaying material in uh, drains and pipes, uh, sewage beds, um, and then you get uh, these coming in because they will lay their eggs in those locations. You may see the adults outside around vegetation as well, like around bushes, because again, if it's uh, damp, um, if you have lots of foliage dropping to the ground, that will encourage that to rot away and start to decompose with the moisture. Yeah. Um, we find them on a fly killer because they have a slight attraction to UV light. Um, and we also find them on windowsills a lot, giving its name the window midge because again, it's attracted to UV light and it's actually trying to get close to that source, leave the building and um, windows are where a lot of UV light will be in a building or a premise. Yeah. So that's the window image. Here we have our mosquito. Um, so this is all on a site. So they just haven't changed their glue walls in a long time. Um, so a lot more spindly, like longer legs, I describe it as, um, and then the antenna are quite distinctive compared to a window image. So the, the antenna, um, they're either really fluffy and hairy like this, um, or they're a li little less hairy, they got, but they still have hairs on them. Uh, this is actually a male. Males have really fluffy antenna, which helps them to take, find females. Um, and the females don't need as many hairs on their antenna, so they usually have less. Um, so in the, in the UK, we do, of course, get mosquitoes. We just don't get them as commonly as in other countries because uh, it's just not warm enough. Um, so we most notably we get Kulex species, which are like um, very common. Um, you may get them on the, the London Underground because it's nice and warm all year round. Um, but we don't get bitten a lot by them in the UK because they will actually feed on animals. So either livestock or wild animals, and we don't really get bitten by them. Um, this one here is a female uh, because it doesn't have the really fluffy antenna. Um, you can also look at these palps, which are long in the males. So they get really long, but they're very short in the female. So they only get end here where they go all the way 
to the end of their proboscis, like that, that, that tube they use for feeding on nectar or feeding on blood if you're female. Yeah. So mosquitoes, if you get them, signs that you have stagnant water somewhere. So stagnant water could be anything like a pond. It could be buckets that people leave out and they collect rainwater. Same with a water butt, collects water over time. Um, it could be blocked guttering. So if you get leaves building up, you're going to have water building up that can't drain away. Um, they really need this water source. So here we have the mosquito larvae, just a picture that you've um, I also took from the internet. Um, but the mosquito larvae feed on microorgana micro scopic organisms in the water. So they, they can't survive in a dry environment, they need that water. Controlling mosquitoes is very simple. Get rid of those water sources. Tip over buckets, cover water butts, um, unblock guttering. Um, you can put fish into ponds, which kind of works. I would say try and aerate the pond or have a filter system so it doesn't just sit there. Um, you can also get stuff like bacteria, which kill mosquito larvae, which you just dunk into ponds, which is really cool. Um, you can just get those on Amazon, by the way. They're called mosquito dunks. Um, and then lastly, we, oh no, not lastly, but here we've got uh, another picture of a fly. Um, I've included this one in because of course we probably get a lot of flies on glue boards. Um, but is it a common house fly or a lesser house fly? That is the harder thing to figure out. Um, this picture on the microscope didn't help me out too much. Uh, this picture I took with my phone is actually really good because we get a good little look at the wing. Um, but under the microscope, you can see that they've got stripes on the back of their thorax. Again, hairs, which most flies will have. Um, but this is Musca domestica or the common house fly. Um, and you can tell the common house fly from the lesser house fly um, by the wings. So in the common house fly here on the right, you have these veins in the wing. And these veins are really useful for identification of different flies. So in the common, it becomes bent and it doesn't reach this edge of the wing. In the lesser house fly, these wing veins will go all the way to the edge. Yeah, um, so that's a, an easy way of turning them apart. Just look at the wing veins. Yeah, if they're straight, they're the lesser. If they're bent, they're the common house fly. Okay. And now we get onto like much more weird, harder insects. And I hope I'm not going to overrun too much. You can always stop me if you want, Natalie. But I can go on about insects all day. Um, so here we have much more of a different one. Uh, this. Is it was a, quite a difficult one to identify because it's a very small little beetle, only a couple of meters big. Um, and a distinctive feature was that there was a, a small lobe on the side of its prothorax, which is this part of the body, kind of like a thorax, but we normally just restrict it to the higher part of the thorax. So this is a foreign grain beetle. And it was quite strange to find on the site because they were a warehouse, they didn't have a lot of food in there. Um, but there must have been food at some point because this beetle feeds on cereals, grains, dried fruit, spices, but all kinds of food materials that have gone mouldy or damp. It doesn't do well in low humidity, so below like 60% humidity, uh, which most places will be. So my room here is probably like 50% humidity. Um, Mould won't grow because it's not damp enough. And so this beetle won't be there either. Um, you can also get them in newly constructed homes because generally these homes aren't great at managing moisture when they're first built. Um, so you get a buildup of moisture, so you get mold growth, and then that attracts these beetles into these locations. Yeah. Um, so likely maybe someone brought like a bag of food in, I forgot about it, maybe it was like a bag of bird seed to feed birds outside. Um, it got mouldy over time and then these beetles came in. Yeah. Then we have some small little flies. So I'm sorry for the picture, it's very blurry, 
Um, but these two small flies often get misidentified. Um, people think they're fruit flies, and one of them is, but they're not both fruit flies. So what you can do is you can look at the wing veins again. And I've got these close-up pictures. I'm afraid the one at the bottom here is not that in focus, but you can just about see this one looks like this. So the veins go straight to the edge of the wing and there's no cross, um, cross vein linking the veins together of the wing. Whereas this one, you can see there's like these marks which connect some of the wings together. So yeah, looking at wing veins is really good. What we have here that is the fruit fly had these cross veins, whereas a forehead fly will have veins that go all the way to the edge. Yeah. And the importance is that these are small flies that often get misidentified, but if you get them, it can mean quite different things in terms of what pest management you're going to do on site. Um, if you have fruit flies, as the name suggests, rotting fruit material, you could get milk and beer as well, but kind of food materials that's kind of starting to go off. If you get forehead flies, it's more associated with sewers and drains and pipes, basically places that pipes that got cracked or they will no longer uh, clear away all that dirty material. Um, so yeah, identifying that species is really useful to actually find out what the issue is, yeah. I'll just pop up quick, Sophie, just a couple of minutes, um, if, if that's OK. And then we've got a couple of questions. That'd be yeah. amazing. Sure. Fabulous. Um, so another one is the fungus, uh, a filter fly, which you also get in sewers and drains. That's another small fly. Um, again, yeah, dirty drains, quite distinctive because it's moth shaped. So it holds the wings apart. Very furry, quite distinctive. Um, and yeah, I will... I'll end it there actually, if that's okay, so that I can answer some questions. Are you sure? Is that is that good? I mean, it's the thing, isn't it? You're just like you get taught. It's just yeah, there's so much to to cover. Um, but yeah, yeah. like you said, I'll, just, you... I'll, I'll be here all day. I'm afraid I'll just go. <laughs> no, no, it's great. You really highlighted um, the 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 important the importance of being able to identify because you know we get lots of images sent to us of different insects, and generally, you know, you can you can identify them. But if you haven't got that close up, you know, of the different veins or or markings, it can be it can be tricky. So um that was great um ian here asks um are lesser house flies and fruit flies attracted to uv light so there is always like oh, how how well do fly killers work at actually attracting insects in um generally all insect, insects have this peak sensitivity to uv light which we mm -hmm. find in our fly killers lesser house flies and fruit flies they're less attracted than the common house fly but they will still end up on your fly killer mm -hmm. yeah Great. Yeah, because you do you do sort of hear that, but then other times you find them. You think, well, it's, yeah. it's a bit bizarre, but it's more the how attracted they're going to be in comparison to other ones. They may just yeah. uh, take a bit more time. Yeah, they're still going to be found on there. It's just when you do lab tests, they're not as attracted. Yeah. As at common house flies. Absolutely. Um, um, another one here. So, uh, so with blue bottles, I think you actually answered this with uh, blue bottles or blue flies, as they've, as they've said on here. If you get them in a the kitchen and you don't know where they're coming from, what do you kind of do? But like you said, that's kind of a, they feed on protein sources or something that might be dead or. Yeah. So, yeah. likely in a kitchen, there's probably maybe a dead animal somewhere. Maybe there's some kind of like protein source elsewhere. Maybe they haven't cleared up. Depends mm -hmm. on the kitchen. Maybe they're producing a lot of meat. Mm -hmm. if not, I would go down the dead animal route usually. Yeah. Maybe it's like a bird in like um like an attic or like on the ledge as well. Mm. It's just finding it, isn't it? Yeah. Really, it's kind of yeah. You've got to investigate those. Um, well, one more question: so about mosquito larvae in water. Can you sort of tackle this by changing the pH level of water? Um, I suppose you could make it like more acidic or more alkaline. I think that would it'd be more difficult to do over time because if you get like rain constantly coming mm -hmm. into the water source is going to start to change the pH again. Mm -hmm. um, I would stick to doing stuff like getting rid of it, covering it if you can, maybe putting like mesh on it to mm -hmm. stop any like mosquitoes that do emerge actually leaving the water source. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, mosquito dunks. I mentioned it briefly, briefly but they're really good because you just get this kind of mm -hmm. dried up tablet that you chuck into water sources. Yeah. And release bacteria that kill the larvae. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, uh, that, and there is one more question that's just popped up for me, Ian, but if you could do a similar thing and just uh, type type your answer in there afterwards. Patricia just said that she's not got a question, but she says you're amazing and could listen to you all day long. So um, there we go. It's always nice to nice to hear that. And absolutely. We all feel the same. Um, so, yeah, really appreciate it, uh, Sophie. And, yeah, we'll be seeing you soon, I'm sure. We'll be getting you to do lots of other things for us. So, everybody, keep watching. <laughs> okay. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Sophie. Bye, bye.